baby, you are gonna go broke showing turkeys like these. It's turkey time. Come on, come on. Enough is never enough. Enough is never enough. All the stuff. The stuff is never enough. The stuff that it tastes that makes you hungry for more. The stuff taste that delivers. Enough is never enough. We interrupt this presentation with the following urgent message. Tonight, America is in grave danger. We are under alien attack by a popular dessert known as the stuff. Here, Jason, take some. No, don't eat that. There is something alive in there. Tasty. There's something alive in yogurt. It's called benign bacteria. If the stuff is in your house, do not eat it. If you have it on your shelves, do not sell it. If you distribute this material, close your doors, make no more sales. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Let's Talk Turkeys. I'm your host, Movie Miss, and I'm being joined by my co-host, Drive-In Dave. Hello, sir. Hola, amigo. So we're recording this on 4th of July weekend, and boy, is it hot. (laughs) And some of this stuff in the movie we're discussing today actually looks pretty tasty on a (laughs) rewatch. Uh, I'm not going to say that. Oh, I was like, it say, felt like ice cream to me. I was like, give me something cool and yummy. I <laughs> See, to me, it felt more like marshmallow fluff. I was into marshmallow fluff. I mean, I recently just discovered fluffer nutters and I was like, oh, those are, those are awesome. They taste so good. And now after this movie, I'm like, nah, I can pass. <laughs> fluffer nutter sounds like something you find on Urban Dictionary. <laughs> she gave him a nice fluffer nutter. <laughs> It probably is. Now that you say it, I'm kind of tempted to go look it up. (laughs) So we're going to be discussing 1985's The Stuff, which I saw for the first time. It slipped through my radar over the years and just not on there. I just saw it for the first time a couple years ago. And this might as well have been my first time watching it because, and I watched it twice in preparation for this, um, because I did not remember it. I, it, it was so awful, I think, that I blocked it from my mind as soon as I was done watching it. <laughs> and before you give your overall thoughts, I just want to mention to everyone, the reason we decided to cover the stuff, yes, it is a turkey, even though it has a Rotten Tomato critic score of 73%, audience of 45, so it's a turkey. But we were just recently uh, guests on another podcast called the Horror Humor Hunger Podcast with host Viggy Parhampton. And she suggested that we cover the stuff. So in honor of Viggy, we decided to go ahead and do it. Now, what did you think? Because this was your first time viewing, correct? Yes, this was my first time viewing. I I knew of it because of uh, a documentary that I watched on Shudder. I think I've mentioned it before that like covered the entire 80s era of horror movies. And I saw it on there and it looked weird, looked hella weird. And I was like, I I don't know, maybe one day I'll check it out. Then, of course, Viggy brings it up. I, I'm 50 50. I'm torn on being like, Viggy, you owe me one. <laughs> but I'm also 50% on there were some moments in this movie that had my ass cracking up. And I actually enjoyed several parts of this movie so much. So I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm really on the fence with this one. Okay. Well, I can't wait to get to that. So it's a, it's a breezy hour, 33 minutes. And even though the movie is a slog in a few parts, Overall, it goes by pretty quick. It was done before I knew it. And I was like, really? That's it? <laughs> okay. Yeah, it felt like uh, it felt like an hour long movie. Like this, this was like an episode of the X-Files or something. I was just like, what the hell, man? That would have made a great episode of the X-Files, honestly. It had a budget of 1.7 million, which was shocking to me to find out. It did have a limited theatrical release. Uh, written and directed by Larry Cohen, who also did, this was very weird to me looking at his list of, of credits. It's Alive in 74, God Told Me To, Q, The Winged Serpent. Like he did a few revered 
80s cheesy movies. So this seems like it'd be right up his alley. You know, that's kind of cool that I didn't know. I, I meant to look him up and I, I skipped it because I got stuck on the actors. But that's cool that he did cue the Wigan Serpent because I just saw that a couple of years ago for the first time when I was going through my binge of watching everything that had giant monsters in it. I love that movie. And, and I love the yeah. fact that we've got a crossover actor in it because I was like, when I saw him, I was like, oh my God, I love this guy. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the crossover? Uh, Michael Moriarty. No, really? Yes. Yes. He was in cue the Wigan Serpent. I don't even remember that. Okay. So this one was shot over a month and a half in New York and uh, Los Angeles, California, and somewhere else. I can't read my handwriting, but uh, (laughs) apparently they needed puppets for death scenes because it wasn't convincing enough when they were trying to shoot death scenes. The best we got was what we saw in the movie, a couple shots of a weird hardened, hardened plasticky version of a blob on people's faces. That's like the best they could do. So they had to go with puppets in order to get the weird shit we get to see. It's a bit cheesy. It's not the best special effects, but you know, it's 85. So I give it a slight pass on that. I see though. I would give it a slight pass, except for the fact that like one of my eighties iconic, like horror movies that I watch all the time is the remake of the blob. I love the remake of the blob. And and then that had good. Yeah. That had good special effects. So like, why couldn't this, this have better special effects? No, I, I fully agree with you. I feel like if $1.7 million budget, they should have done a little better. But I I guess they did what they, they could. When the stuff is actually shown being eaten on screen, it's ice cream, yogurt, and whipped cream. It looks delicious when they're eating it to me. I'm like, ooh, I want some of that. It looks like ice cream pretty much to me. It looked like fluff to you, you said, though. To me, at times, it looked like marshmallow fluff. But then there are times where it kind of looks like like melted ice cream or uh, like I said, yogurt or something. (laughs) (laughs) Did you find any other um, production notes? Because that's all I had for production. Uh, There was a couple things I I found. There was one I thought that was really cool. If you want, I can bring it up now or I can bring it up when it happens. The scene in the motel room when uh, the stuff comes out and everything like that, that was the same uh, room that they used in uh, Johnny Depp's death scene in Nightmare on Elm Street. Really? Yes. I saw that. I was like, that is fucking cool. I I don't know if he did that as like a nod to Nightmare on Elm Street or what. But I'm I'm sure it was was practical to do that, I would think, because the way the room spins... See, that's kind of what I thought, like after, because I, I read this after I watched it and I should, I kind of want to go back and watch it again to see if it kind of like resembles the scene or not. So yeah, Elm Street being 85, they were probably shooting around the same time because I was like, well, wait a minute, they they tore that set down, but it would be, it would still be in existence at the same time they were shooting this. So they probably shared soundstage stuff and were like, yeah, we, we totally want to use that set. So That totally makes sense. I'm not going to question that one. (laughs) You're not going to question it? It's not you. It's the actual places that the research is found. Sometimes you have to question it, especially if it's IMDb. You always have to take it with a grain of salt. Yeah, Yeah, this came from IMDb. So they on IMDb said that this was on the audio commentary for the 2000 Anchor Bay DVD. Okay, so So then that I would believe if you hear it from the horse's mouth on a commentary... So you're but call- ever you're since calling- IMDb became like Wikipedia, where people can contribute to it, I don't trust it as much. Uh, I have trouble as well. But but am, am I getting this correct that you were calling Larry Cohen a horse because you just said the horse's mouth? Is that are you are you insulting the man right now? <laughs> well, if the uh, what do you call those little things that you put on their hooves? <laughs> if the horseshoe fits. So you mentioned the, the- Michael Moriarty. Let's talk about cast. Okay, yeah, because yeah, there's a cool thing, a couple of cool things with cast. Like there's some people in here I really freaking enjoyed. Okay. Top build cast, we have Michael Moriarty, of course, and Andrea Mar- Marcovici, Garrett Morris, Paul Sorvino, which was a weird surprise that I was pleased with. We have Scott Bloom introducing Scott Bloom and Danny Aiello as a weird little role, which I was, again, pleasantly surprised. And uh, there's a few other people we can get to him as we go. So let's talk there, about there's... this top build cast. Okay, and there's one before we get into the top build cast. There's one I want to bring up because she was uncredited, and I don't know if this oh. is one of her first roles or not, but she played a factory okay. worker, uh, Mira Sorvino. Ah, that makes sense. Factory worker, so she must be in some of those scenes when they're touring the factory, quote unquote. 
I like her. I mean, I'm not like a huge, huge fan. Uh, so if she's listening to this, I apologize. I'll become a huge fan if you, you know, listen to the podcast and write me. Um, <laughs> so you're bribing her now? Yes, exactly. But I mean, the, the stuff that I've seen her, I do enjoy. She's been she's been cool. But I, I yeah, I didn't even notice her. So I kind of want to go back and look for her to see if it's uh, kind of like Blossom and Pumpkinhead. Of like, are you going to notice her or not? <laughs> so Andrea Markovici as Nicole, which I keep calling her Miss Kendall throughout the entire run through because I never heard her called Nicole. I assume she is at some point called by her first name. I kept hearing the Miss Kendall part. In the beginning, I heard Miss Kendall, but I want to say towards the end, I thought I heard Nicole a couple of times. Okay. That, yeah, that's weird. Uh, Garrett Morris <laughs> as Chocolate Chip Charlie. I had to ask my husband about this. He goes, you know, kind of like the famous Amos cookie guy because he owns a cookie company and they the family steals it from him. Oh. I was like, oh. <laughs> yeah, I didn't even catch that. Okay. Yeah, I thought yeah. the same thing. I was like, Chocolate Chip Charlie. What the fuck, man? <laughs> yeah kind of like famous Amos cookies like he he has a cookie company he's the face of it the name of it because I didn't put that together watching the movie they did a poor job of of conveying that I thought because they could they did a good job portraying everything else apparently <laughs> yeah no they really didn't Garrett Morris was a treat though uh, I was really unfamiliar with his body of work and, and him in general as an actor until I recently started catching reruns of that show from the 2000s um, Two Broke Girls Oh, yeah. He's, I'm very familiar with his work. I, I love He's a him. regular He's on that. They wanted Arsenio Hall for this role. Oh, God, no. Which, yeah, seemed like a weird fit to me. Like, he wouldn't have fit. I think Garrett Morris is great in this. It's good casting. No, I, I thought he worked really well with uh, Michael Moriarty, too. I thought the two, like, I, I would love to see more movies with them together because they just, they worked off of each other so beautifully. That's kind of what helped make this movie for me. Chocolate chip Charlie, if he if he hadn't died, spoiler alert, but we'll get to it. Yeah, that would have been fun. So Paul Sorvino as Colonel Spears. <laughs> and he, he passed away last year in 2022. But boy, did he have an impressive catalog. And like you mentioned, father of, of Mira Sorvino. And I at first I was like, really, I don't see it. But then when I was looking up pictures of them online together, like on red carpets and stuff, you can totally see it. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I, I was sad when he passed because he, he was in like three of my favorite movies uh, growing really? up. Really? Well, I mean, like one of them more recently. But yeah, he was uh, Lips, Manless, and Dick Tracy. And I love okay. Dick Tracy. That's such a horrible movie, but it's it's amazing to watch. I feel like uh, it's a contender Eddie... for the show. <laughs> oh, I please, God, yes. I, I would love to do that for an episode. I fucking love that movie. It's so bad, but it's great. I remember seeing it in the theater, for God's sakes. Wow. He was Eddie Valentine in The Rocketeer, which is another absolute oh, favorite of mine. Yes, me too. Love that one. Uh, and then a more recent one that I think kind of fell under the radar. It's kind of more of a cult classic. He was uh, Roddy Largo in Repo the Genetic Opera. I've seen that and I actually really liked it because it had um, the guy from Buffy as the lead character. Uh, Giles from Buffy, the show. Oh, that's right. That's right. I was trying to remember which one was in there. That's right. Yep. And uh, I was like, oh, I, he's in this. I have to watch it. And I ended up really liking it for some reason. It's not my bag, really. It's not mine either. A friend of mine got me hooked on it. He wanted me to watch it one day. I was like, this, this movie's going to fucking suck, dude. I don't want to watch this shit. And then I came back. I was like, <laughs> oh, my God, I hate you because I'm obsessed with this movie now. And so then, uh, of course, we mentioned Danny Aiello has a weird little part where he pops up and... I'm obsessed with him. I love him. I mean, Jacob's Ladder, Hudson Hawk. He's in so much stuff that I love. And I was like, what are you doing in this movie? <laughs> I was not familiar with his work until more recently. Uh, me and the girlfriend had to watch Do the Right Thing. And he was amazing in that movie. Also, my first ever time watching a Spike Lee movie. And I freaking loved it, actually. Uh, surprisingly, I loved it. And what else? He was in a couple other movies that like, I recently just discovered that. Oh, uh, the one with Cher. Moonstruck. Um, thank you. I just recently watched that again with a girlfriend. That's a fun I, one. That movie I freaking loved as well. <laughs> <laughs> Snap out of it. <laughs> Sometimes I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be honest. Sometimes I get so irritated with her because she gets me hooked on these movies that I don't think I'm going to like going in. And then mm -hmm. I watch it. And I'm like, damn it. Now I really <laughs> like this movie. Hey, no shame in what you like. No shame. Uh, and then we've got little introducing little Scott Bloom, who is the younger brother of actor Brian Bloom. 
he's in this playing his older brother, Brian is. What's funny to me, I'll post pictures of them on socials for this, a side by side I did of them. Their eyes, their eyes, they're like, they're like Meg Foster eyes. They're this bright, piercing, pale blue. And you can just see the resemblance immediately. You're like, oh, wow, they actually got brothers to play the brothers. <laughs> I was kind of surprised. I expected him to go on to be a bigger actor. And then I was when I was looking up like what he did, he didn't do much, really. Mm -mm. Brian, though, Brian's been going at it. When you say going at it, what do you mean by that? <laughs> His career. Oh, OK. All right. IMDb plot. A delicious, mysterious goo that oozes from the earth. <laughs> you lost me, but OK. Is marketed as the newest dessert sensation. But the tasty treat rots more than teeth when zombie-like snackers who only want to consume more of the strange substance at any cost begin infesting the world. That is the most <laughs> accurate yet not accurate description of a movie. <laughs> what zombies? What are they? That was pretty bad, but I loved your reading of it. Like I, like I can almost hear that in the trailer of like you going off and like in a world <laughs> where the stuff comes from the bottom of the earth. In a world where goo oozes. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's the weirdest description, but I, I was like when I when I, I did this research before watching it again, you know, after all these years, and I'm like, zombies. I don't remember zombies. It turns them into what? Boy, was I disappointed that it just meant like mindless drones who just want to keep eating more stuff. And I like in the movie, Colonel Spears and them call them stuffies. The people who are possessed by eating the stuff, they're like, the stuffies. <laughs> what do they call the, the people that like to have sex with other people in costumes? Furries. Furries? Yes. We furries. got the furries and the stuffies. <laughs> oh, that's the, okay. I, I'm going to say a, a furry convention would have been interesting to see just because like, I'm curious what the fuck goes on there. Uh, I would be really creeped out by a stuffy convention because I don't want to see what's going on behind closed doors with that one. <laughs> All right, let's jump into this film. So the movie begins with a cold open. I love a good cold open. I really do. This one, bizarre. It just opens on a man walking, which we later find out is this quarry area where the stuff is in the ground. But from this shot, it looks like just a weird industrial place out in the middle of nowhere and it's snowing. And the snow in some places is banked up and, and pushed up to where it's several feet high. It looked weird. I, I don't know about you, but were you getting kind of vibes like in the opening from the thing, from John Carpenter's version of the thing? Yes, for sure. And I'm wondering how in this giant snowfall, he manages to find a hole where this stuff is bubbling up. I thought that was pretty impressive. I do have a thought on that. I yeah. wonder, was that the shithole? Was that like, like, did they not have any other place to shit out there? And so he was going to the shithole and then just saw like, oh, this white bubbly stuff. Of course, that would make it even weirder. Why would you be eating out of the shithole? He, he readily reaches down when he sees this stuff and scoops it up with his fingers and immediately starts tasting it. How is that your first response to seeing some weird shit on the ground? Let's taste it and see what this is. This is what stuffies do. It's so gross. So... His first instinct, like I said, is to lick this stuff off his fingers. And he says, so smooth, tastes real good, tasty, sweet. <laughs> That's like our first bit of dialogue in this movie. While he stands there in the snow outside licking goo off his fingers. <laughs> I was like, what the fuck am I watching? So you, you thought the same thing. Like, is this going to be a fetish movie? <laughs> so bizarre. So then another man sees him out there and yells at him. Hey, Harry, blah, blah, blah. What are you doing? You know, so we learn this is Harry. Harry eats some more of this stuff right off his fingers, smacking his lips. I was like, oh, God, stop, stop. I mean, we're we're four seconds in and my senses are on high alert already. So another man. <laughs> what? I'm really bothered by that. <laughs> I just see you getting creeped out by this, watching some old guy sucking his fingers with stuff from the ground. <laughs> it's so disgusting. And the noises he's making, it's so gross. I can't stand it when my husband's sitting next to me and he's slurping cereal or slurping a drink. <laughs> I have to give him side eye. <laughs> this was gross. I had to power through it. 
Another man wanders up to Harry and asks him if he's eating snow. As long as it isn't yellow, I suppose it's okay. Hey, there's nothing wrong with lemon flavor. Gross. Make me want a cactus icy. So Harry says, it's not snow. You should try it. And he shoves his gooey fingers right into the man's face. Oh my God. Thank God this man didn't lick it off of Harry's fingers because I would have puked. I, I'm not going to lie. I was hoping for that. I was like, this movie's taking such a weird turn. Let's just let's just go with it, man. We're one minute in. Just just go with it. Just have him start sucking the fingers and you just start hearing the bounce, bounce, bounce. So the man takes his glove off and dabs a little off of Harry's finger and then tries it. And he says, what the hell is it? Good question. You don't know what it is and you're eating it. So we zoom in on Harry's face and he's just got smear it's so gross it's so foul he has smears of the goo all around his mouth i could like i could smell the screenshot i was like get him off camera i'm just dead it's me, so bad why would you take anything off of harry's fingers so i mean i mean like if i know <laughs> i've known a few harry's in my life and they're not the kind of people that i'm going to be sucking anything off of their fingers because i know where those fingers have been so so harry She's got this shit all over his mouth. He's got it on his hands. He reaches down and grabs some more and shovels it in his mouth after saying, boy, if there's enough of this, we could sell it to people. And that's our opening shot. That's our introduction to this movie right there, folks. <laughs> now, if I didn't have to watch it for the show, I probably would have turned it off because I forgot that the movie opened like that. I was so thoroughly disgusted. It's so foul. I wish I could have seen that. I could just see the bag, like, getting ready to throw up and like, oh, God. <laughs> I was. I was cringing so hard. So then we cut to a young boy in his bedroom. And I'm terrible with this, as we've established. He's maybe 14, 13. He looks like maybe he's tiny for his age and he's supposed to be about 12 or 13. I don't know. What did you, what did you peg about, him as? Yeah, I was getting about 12 or 13 because he, he was a little okay. bit more mature, but like not like too mature. Okay, good. So I was I was close. <laughs> That's what I thought. So this is Scott Bloom. And I have to say, he's a grown man now. So I'm going to go ahead and insult him. When he came on screen, I was like, he's got the kind of face and you'll see it for yourself on social media when I post a picture. Those of you listening, if you haven't seen him, he looks his head, his face looks like he looks very old. And then when they pull back and you see his face on this little kid's body, it's a weird disconnect because he looks like he, thank God he grew into his face, but his face looks like a grown man's face on a child's body. It's very, very weird. And so I had a hard time getting into this because I'm, every time I looked at him, I was like, you're not a little kid. Like you, your face looks so much older. I know I'm not making any sense right now. That's not where I thought you were going to go with that rant. I really, I, I thought you were going to say that he had a face that only a mother could love. And even she left him at an amusement park. No, he's not an, an ugly child and nor is his brother. They're good looking kids. But my problem was he looked old. His face just had, he has an old soul of a face. It was really weird. I just see like his mother saying that to him. Like, I, I love you, baby, but you just, you look like an old man to me for some reason. Just, I just, no, I, I can't, I can't deal with you anymore. Just go away. Go to your room. Also the parents in this, the mom looks like their older sister and like she spends her days aerobicizing and at, at the juice bar. Like she did not look like their mom. It was very weird to me. So the credits are rolling now over the scene in the bedroom and we get title card. I noticed on the credits, it said special guest star, Danny Aiello. And I was like, special guest star. Was this a TV movie? And I'm, I'm unaware that it, no, it, it had a limited theatrical release, but I thought, wow, that's like a TV movie would say special guest star, right? Like not a regular theatrical movie. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't recall ever hearing that in a movie for a special guest star because like they're all basically guest stars because it's, it's one, it's one fucking movie. Like how do you have a guest star in one movie? Right. It's not like it's, they're filming Fantasy Island or something. This would have been the worst episode of Fantasy Island ever. The stuff, <laughs> boss, the stuff. My fantasy is to be a stuffy. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> Ballroom four, sir, over there. That's where the convention for stuffies is. <laughs> so the kid says... To nobody. Boy, it's hot. So he wanders downstairs to the kitchen, turns on the kitchen faucet, uses his hands to take two splashes of water just right into his mouth. And I'm like, what, what kid does that? Why wouldn't you grab a cup or go to the fridge and get a cold drink out of the fridge? 
<laughs> he just like he's at a gas station, just goes over to the faucet and splashes water into his mouth. Yeah, I just I thought like no. I, I thought he was gonna splash his face or something or like wash his pits or something, but like the drink that is like the kind of weird shit that like people do, like you said, at like a gas station or something. Yeah. So then he goes to the fridge after that, which again I was like, why didn't you just go to the fridge and get a cold drink? He opens it and sees a container marked the stuff. It's tipped over and the white goo is moving itself back into the container. <laughs> I was like, hmm, okay, I'm on board for this now after opening scene creeped me out. This is cool. So he gets startled by his dad who comes in and reprimands him for needing a glass of water. <laughs> he just thinks he's up to up to shenanigans, swats him on the ass and sends him back to bed. Uh, you're a dick, sir. <laughs> Your poor little I, hot child needed something cool. I thought this family was like the worst family before they become stuffies. I was like, this kid needs to get the hell out of there. Like, where, where the fuck is Child Protective Services at this point? Right? He winds up better off at the end of this, really. Exactly. So he closes the fridge, the father does, without putting the lid back on the stuff, which is so irritating to me. Messy fridges are like a pet peeve of mine. It's so crazy to me when people leave stuff sticky and gooey and don't put lids on properly i'm i ocd thing with me maybe i don't know but this was so bad um remind me to uh, have, have me send pictures of my refrigerator to you then <laughs> you get mad at me and you're like i know how to taunt her <laughs> here's my fridge but it's either um, that or dark man <laughs> <laughs> so julie <laughs> I cannot hear that name now and not hear that in my head, you fucker. <laughs> <laughs> my job is done. <laughs> so then we see now dad decides to go right back to that fridge as soon as he closes the door and starts eating the stuff right out of the container. Cut to commercials for the stuff. We have a lady in a fur coat and there's a neon sign. There's a lady saying in a real sultry voice, like Red Shoe Diary style, the voiceover for the stuff. And don't you want it? It's tasty and blah, blah, blah. And I'm just cracking up. I'm like, really? I, I was alive in the 80s and I know this is supposed to mimic some of the commercials, but this one's bad. I don't remember one for food with a lady in a fur coat with a neon I got, sign. I got two thoughts. <laughs> One, the fact that you said Red Shoe Diaries just made me go like, oh, yeah, I got to go watch some Showtime now. Um, <laughs> uh, and then two, I'm watching this on Tubi. You know, Tubi's got like fucking commercials like every five minutes, basically. So when this commercial popped up, I thought it was a real commercial. I was like, what the fuck are they selling right now? <laughs> what is this? <laughs> this is the worst commercial I've ever seen. <laughs> so we cut to a gaggle of businessmen in business suits on a yacht out sailing conducting business okay they say that they've had zero luck analyzing the ingredients in the stuff so that they can copy it because they're jealous of how well it's selling they've decided now to try sending a spy known as mo rutherford but his name is david rutherford and he just goes by Mo, and we'll find out why in a minute. They want to send Mo in to the company to steal the secrets because the company is expanding and they're buying other companies. And this was where I missed something about how there, there's a cookie company, which obviously is Chocolate Chip Charlie's company that they're talking about. I didn't know this until after doing research. I still didn't know it until you just literally told me that. <laughs> Yeah, they're, they're talking about buying up other companies. The stuff is just expanding like crazy. And I was like, well, why would you buy other food companies? That doesn't make sense. But a lot of things in this movie I'm going to pick apart doesn't make sense. So Mo arrives via speedboat up to the yacht. And he is one cocky son of a bitch for somebody who's got a bad rug. He has attitude for days. And I'm like, bro, the hair, the hair. 
That is a bad wig. I didn't even notice. That's how cocky he, he was. His confidence came off so well that I was like, I didn't even notice. I was just like, I, I, I love you. Uh, you're awesome. <laughs> you want Mo of Mo. So he tells the men to fill him in on the stuff. This whole bunch of dialogue follows. Nothing short of amazingly bad writing. I was laughing so hard. So we have to dissect a couple things. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> uh, no, I, I mean, I, I first off, I have to say the best introduction to a character ever to me, just because when he comes in to shake hands, it's sweaty palm, sweaty palm, sweaty palm. I was like, that's whoever wrote that is just brilliant because that was hilarious. No! <laughs> yes, yes. I, I, you cannot, you cannot take this away from me. That was amazing. So the first suit after all that introduction speaks right up and says, well, you've been briefed already. Then why would you even need to meet at all if he's already been briefed? That was my first thing. I was like, what? Maybe they were okay. talking about his underwear. <laughs> he's been debriefed. <laughs> <laughs> so then Mo says, yes, but I don't understand why you men didn't go to the FDA, which is the Food and Drug Administration, to which another man with I call I called him Beard. He's got a nice suit, but he's got a big old beard. So Beard says after the stuff was approved, most of the people who were involved resigned from the FDA, went on vacation, or left the country. And Mo adds, or they were paid off, because that's the American way. <laughs> so to me, this little bit, it was unclear why they're trying to investigate things with the FDA. What, what are you going to learn about the stuff, really, by questioning people who gave it a pass at the FDA? Honestly, at this point, I checked out on trying to make it's any sense of this movie. Five minutes in, you've checked out already? Yeah, yeah. well, I, the, <laughs> moment, the moment everything, like the first five minutes, everything that happened in those five minutes just made me check out on trying to understand what the hell was happening. Just be like, okay, this movie's basically just going to make it happen. It's, it's like sex with Bill Cosby. You can say no all you want, but it's going to happen at some point. So I was like, this, this is just what had happened. So another suit with a five head, I called him five head because he's got a giant forehead, says that they've never had so much trouble getting info out of a company. Oh, okay. Mo tells them, don't worry, he'll get the info, no problem, but it's going to be expensive. Obviously, you hire a private contractor to do shady shit, it's not cheap. So that, that tracks. There could be a coupon out there somewhere. <laughs> so glasses suit guy, he pipes up and says, well, we don't want to know how you do it. Just do it. My God, why did we even have to have this meeting on a secret yacht? But OK, so Mo gets up and he says he understands they don't like him because we find out he's been fired from the FBI. We don't know why. Someone said he was obscene. And then we learn that he heard Beard say that he was obscene because he pulls a little microphone out of the guy's suit pocket and mentions that he just casually slipped into his hotel room last night and slipped the mic into his pocket. Oh, Mo, you sneaky, sneaky man. <laughs> but the only thing that was funny to me in this was as soon as he reveals that there was a mic in the guy's pocket, we get a cut of everybody else checking their pockets. I like that. Uh, but I mean, were you when you've heard that, that he snuck in uh, and put the, the microphone into the pocket and then snuck out? Were you thinking the same thing I was thinking that, like, for God's sake, please show that scene and have Mo be ninja vanish? I didn't need to see that. No, but that's pretty funny. I, that, I can picture him now acting like that. So Mo tells everyone they only know him by that name. And he says he got that name because every time people give him money. He always wants Mo. <laughs> mo money, Mo money, Mo money. I feel like that was an in living color joke just waiting to happen. <laughs> really, bro? I, just, I love this guy. He's so good in this. But he, I mean, it's so bad that it's good. That is one of the worst things of all time, especially because he changes it up later and gives a different excuse for why his name is Mo later. And I'm like, dude, stick to one story, OK? You have to keep them off balance by like always changing your origin story. You can never have them like <laughs> know your true origin story. So Bearded Suit tells Mo he doesn't think he's as dumb as he appears to be. And I was like, he doesn't appear to be dumb. He appears to be pretty fucking slick. 
with a lot of confidence unfounded but yes he he seems very slick with a lot of confidence not dumb at all so that didn't yeah. make any sense that line i was like what it made sense to me because it basically just sets up another one of my favorite lines of the entire movie with the no one is as dumb as i appear <laughs> <laughs> so one guy had been giving mo grief on the way in so now on the way out he decides to call that guy an asshole and punch him in the face <laughs> okay and then I like that we get voiceover of one of the other guys going, you broke his jaw. I saw that hit. There's no way he broke that guy's jaw. Sorry. <laughs> What's up, VHS heads? I'm Matt. Join me and my two broskies, Chris and Dave, on our movie comparison podcast, The VHS Abyss, putting two movies from the golden age of cinema against each other. Whether it's a teenage soldier head-to-head, like Red Dawn versus Toy Soldiers, or simply picking two from a back catalogue of icons of the VHS era, like Roddy Piper or Jamie Lee Curtis. Whatever link we can find between two films, we've got you covered. With facts, gaffes and plenty of laughs along the way, join us on all podcast platforms to discover who will be crowned champion of the episode. We are the VHS Abyss. Whether it's a hit or a miss, we love to reminisce. This episode is brought to you by Truly Unique Jewelry. You're a one of a kind, so it's unique, spelled Y-O-U-N-I-Q-U-E. With all of the jewelry options mass produced for each season, you're left wanting more when it comes to pieces that showcase your individual style. Head over to trulyuniquejewelry.com and scroll through handmade one of a kind options for every budget with pieces starting under a dollar. Beautiful costume jewelry to fit every age and every budget. Custom orders are also available for no additional charge, and they flat rate ship so you can fill your jewelry box with matching pieces for every outfit in your closet for one shipping fee. From earrings to bracelets to necklaces, even rosaries and combination sets. Cost is no longer a barrier to having the looks that you want that scream uniquely you. Go to the Facebook page for Truly Unique Jewelry for updates and discount information when you follow the page. Feel good about supporting a small business while you're updating and expanding your jewelry collection, adding pieces for every occasion. Visit trulyuniquejewelry.com. And remember, it's unique spelled Y-O-U-N-I-Q-U-E. And now, back to the show. So we cut to the breakfast table of the family from the opening and the mom tells the older brother, this is Brian Bloom. Uh, and this is where I took a screenshot of him. And it's a weird picture because he's chewing his cereal. <laughs> he's chewing his bite as he looks up at his mom, tells the older brother, go get your younger brother. So just then the kid comes down and bitchy mom and dickhead dad snap at him about not missing any more school. Older brother jumps up from his cereal grabs a canister of the stuff from the fridge and decides sweet white goo is the perfect thing to chase his cereal with at 7 a.m. That's how addicted he is. <laughs> Gross. Ooh. I mean, aren't we all addicted to sweet white goo? <laughs> no. So if anything, this is marketed in the movie even as a dessert item. So I'm like, that's weird that you would grab it and have it for breakfast, but okay. Hey, I've had ice cream for breakfast before, so uh, I'm not exactly going to. Of course, you know, look where that got me. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag diabetic life. <laughs> <laughs> the little brother says, don't eat that. It's spoiled. And he's just trying to cover for the fact that he saw it moving in the fridge, but he doesn't want to actually say that. The mom tastes it and says, it's fine. And she grabs a spoon and tries to shovel some into the poor kid's mouth. He says no, so Big Brother decides to eat it. Because again, that's a healthy way to start your day. Then the little kid blurts out, he saw it move on its own, so I'm not eating it. <laughs> Good call. And I like that the older brother is immediately acts like an older brother and he goes, freak. <laughs> and then he goes, what are you on? And I'm like, really? You're accusing your small, younger child brother of being on something? No, don't eat that. There's nothing wrong with it. I had some last night. I'm telling you, it isn't good. It's spoiled. Here, you taste it and tell me if you think it's spoiled. It moves. I saw it move in the refrigerator. <laughs> hey, freak, what do you want anyway? Jason, you come back here. No, I hope these stains come out. The family 
came off as like the most bitchy, annoying, like the dad and the mom were just complete assholes. I hated that. But the older brother, I thought, like I said, they nailed that dynamic perfectly because having an older brother growing up, like that's what it was like. If you, you insulted your brother or he insulted you, you're like, hey, asshole, you know, good morning, dickhead. <laughs> <laughs> this is what it was. And they're actually brothers. So that kind of is another layer. Yeah. So we learned the kid's name is Jason. So Jason slaps that stuff out of his mom's hand and it splatters all over the floor and on the cabinets and he runs off. And the mom is yelling, I hope these stains come out. And I'm like, bitch, really? Grab some paper towels. <laughs> it's going to be fine. He hasn't stained your disgusting orange oak cabinets. <laughs> No, I, and she looked like the kind of mom that's used to having white stains all over the place anyways. She's wiping it down and she's like, it's not even spotting. It's, <laughs> it tastes good and it's low in calories. It's like, oh, that's so gross. So we cut to a lab with numerous Petri dishes marked the stuff one, the stuff two, etc. We're not only 10 minutes in at this point. And this scene solidified for me that you will go insane if you try to follow this plot very closely at all, <laughs> because it goes off the rails here. I'm attempting to make sense of all this gobbledygook, you know, but it was hard. There's a chalkboard in the background with all this sciency sketching and equations and molecule looking diagrams and shit on it. I don't even know what it was. Guy in a lab coat tells Mo, there's nothing like it. Mo asks something about it being coupled with a benign bacteria. Okay. Then the lab coat says, it's probably just a lucky accident that it tastes great. <laughs> then Mo says, they seem to reproduce this accident in great quantities. To which lab coat says, <laughs> that's what he doesn't understand. Science isn't breaking through on this one, I guess. He thought there was some government regulation that requires them to reveal the contents of their product on the packaging. Another guy in a suit now who's in the lab doing stuff says, oh, no, no, they're protected by the FDA statute of identity rule, just like Coca-Cola. So <laughs> I had to look that up. Okay. <laughs> you know, Here I did. Go. And that's a real thing. Coca-Cola has to say some things along the lines of uh, natural and artificial flavors, but they don't have to divulge every single little bit of their formula because it's a secret. But apparently these guys are whining that the stuff doesn't even mark their ingredients on the package at all. And how do they get away with that? And then later we see lots of these containers and there's no writing on them. They've got these pink and brown and purple, I think is the color scheme, if I remember correctly. The words, the stuff, and then those colored stripes go around the package. But that's all it is. A little white tub with these colored stripes on it. There's no like list of ingredients at all on this package. So I, didn't, right. I didn't see a barcode. So like, how would you scan? I mean, working for retail, I would think you have to have a barcode on it at least. Yeah, agreed. So then they get interrupted when a lady comes in dressed in an ill-fitting blue suit. <laughs> She just comes walking in with his big old jacket, carrying a clipboard, trying to look official. Mo says the little lady entering the room is doing some undercover research for him. <laughs> what? Okay, whatever. And then this is where this is bonkers to me. And you probably didn't catch this because you don't watch with an eagle eye like I do. <laughs> yes, I pick it the fuck apart. We get a wide shot of all of them standing in this room. And now it's a voiceover of Mo because we can't actually see his face saying, because if folks are going to find out the secret formula of the stuff, we're going to have to steal it. Now, as he's passing behind equipment coming around to the front of the shot, I'm paying attention to the little bits where we can see his face little and I'm pausing it. His mouth doesn't move for this entire motion of him starting on one side walking behind the equipment and people and around to the front where the lady's standing with the clipboard, his mouth doesn't open at all. It doesn't move at all. He doesn't speak. But there's full voiceover of him saying this line that they have to steal the secret formula. I was maybe like, oh, was movie. Maybe this was like an inner dialogue moment of like he was thinking <laughs> it and like well, the, the, the director is letting us into Mo's brain. He does it more than once. Apparently we get to know how Mo thinks more than once. Yeah, this was terrible. Terrible. So they obviously shot the scene and had him saying it in some other way or time or part of the shot, and they decided to change it. 
And you can tell if you watch this movie, the studio interfered and wanted them to make a straight horror movie. Larry Cohen wanted to do a horror comedy, leaning on the comedy. Now they went back and forth on cuts of this. Apparently there's an extra 30 minute cut or something that exists, but it's never been released. I think knowing that information, you can tell this movie is choppy as hell. We get abrupt cuts and immediately jump to something else when a scene feels like it didn't organically finish. Did you notice that? A lot of the scenes don't seem like they come to a natural conclusion. We just abruptly cut away after a line. Yeah, I caught that. It was very choppy. So that kind of, I think that kind of one of the things that threw me off a little bit. And then now knowing that it went back and forth between horror and comedy, that makes a lot of sense too, because there's some really, there's a couple of really cool horror mo moments in this movie. And there's some really great comedy moments. They don't seem to fit well together. This is like trying to get a killer whale and a penguin to have sex. It may seem like a cool idea in your mind, but the actual product of it happening is going to be ugly as hell. Agreed. They couldn't pick a lane and it they should have just went straight comedy, I think, because this is just silly. Yeah. If you would have went straight comedy, this would have been like, like one of my favorite just bad parody comedy movies. It's like horror. Um, Attack of the Killer Tomatoes, the original one. It's yeah. so fucking ridiculous and stupid, but it's fun. This could have been on par with that if you would have went the comedy route. Agreed. So we cut to the neon sign saying the stuff and there's women on a runway in swimsuits. And again, fur coats <laughs> what the hell and they're filming a commercial for the stuff i don't remember the 80s commercials as well as you do so uh was there a lot of like half naked women in 80s commercials yeah but it was usually like women on the beach drinking a cool tab or something it wasn't like also wearing a fur coat walking a runway <laughs> this is super okay, yeah. bizarre yeah, I was, I was gonna say, like, I don't picture like Ben and Jerry's with, you know, like Nicki Minaj and a thong shaking her ass or something and be like, hey, Ben and Jerry's like that. That commercial doesn't seem like it's going to fit. And that seems like that's the, the vibe they were going for with these commercials. <laughs> yeah. So the song playing in the background for this, the stuff's theme song. Did you catch any of it? No, I need to go back and hear it. I thought I saw something where like people were kind of like laughing about it, like it was just ridiculous or something. <laughs> So you can't really hear the whole thing solid, but you hear like satisfied, something sweet. And then you get a line where somebody says, the, the lady singing, my lips crave more and more each day. One lick is never enough of the stuff. <laughs> and then she says like something, something excited. And it's a sweet surprise. It's like the worst song ever. <laughs> for How a the product. fuck is this not a porno? <laughs> <laughs> I know. So Mo pushes his way in and interrupts the shoot and tells everybody to take five because he has to speak to the director. And I like that the, the lady turns around and goes, who the hell are you? Like, why are you breaking up my shoot, you asshole? <laughs> a lot of balls, this guy, for a hairpiece. Let me tell you. I keep thinking that every time he does something bold. So everyone breaks and Mo sits this lady down, calls her awful pretty and gives her his business card. She's a dummy because she's this boss bitch director on set, but she's easily swayed by this man going, gee, you're pretty. <laughs> she's like, really? Let me just strip for you right now. <laughs> Basically was how I felt. <laughs> There's obviously women out there like that. So maybe that's what they were going for. Was that kind of woman? You know, she pretends to be a boss bitch. And then like secretly, she's just, you know, I, I mean, plus it kind of goes with the porno vibe. So she looks at the business card and she goes, oh, David Rutherford. And he goes, well, my friends call me Mo. And here's where we get another line of why. He says, they call me Mo because every time they give me something, I always want Mo. I, I swear to God, if somebody said that to me in real life, I'd be like, you're a fucking douchebag. Get out of my face. I think that's one of the greatest pickup lines I've ever heard in my entire life, to be honest with you. I, I want to try change that your name somebody. to Mo? I, 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 I want to try that now. I, I'm going to see if I can get the girlfriend to accept that. A constant pickup line on her. So she is somehow magically charmed by this douche. Goes ahead and gives him the time of day. No problem. You interrupted my, my shoot. It's fine. What do you need? He tells her he wants to put her on their public relations campaign for this oil company. And... She needs to do better at selling the fact that the petroleum company has public interest at heart because she was the creative talent behind marketing the stuff. So they want her. 
he's like, I'm going to just buy you. Like I'm going to full on hire you and give you a shit ton of money, not just make a commercial for us. She says she doesn't have time to work for them and promote petroleum companies. And Mo says, I'll buy your whole agency and put you in charge. And the first thought I had when he said that was, how much money did those suits give him? Holy shit. (laughs) They really want to know about the stuff bad. Well, you know, stuffies are addicted to to this stuff. So, you know, they, they will drop all kinds of money to get that stuff inside of them. She's shocked by this, calls her assistant over, hands her the business card and tells her, thoroughly check this guy out. Now, this is 1984, 85. So that bitch is not Googling anybody. Do you know how much legwork and time it takes to research somebody in the 80s? It's not like today. I was born in 81, so I don't think I actually would have remembered that. It it was not like it is today at all. It was a lot of legwork. But she immediately comes back to Mo and says, no problem. Let's figure this out. And it's like the bitch hasn't even done the research for you yet. And you're already agreeing to this. You don't know anything about this man. He's charming as fuck. I mean, who, who's not going to fall for his magical lines? Everyone wants Mo. Oh, my God. <laughs> no, everyone doesn't. I don't want to grab your hair in a moment of passion and have it come right off the fucking head. No, thank you, sir. So I do like to see a woman with decision is what he tells her. He tells her, pick a restaurant. And she immediately boldly asks where he's staying. Can they get room service? He's like, yeah, my limo's right outside. And she goes, so is mine. And he goes, mine's bigger than yours. It's so fucking stupid. I swear to God, I lost IQ points just watching this. If that's true, I'm sending Biggie a handwritten thank you letter. So we cut now to a grocery store where lots of people are purchasing the stuff. Little Jason is in there wandering around unsupervised. Comes to another small child in a shopping cart eating the stuff right out of the container. He basically just slaps it out of the kid's hands and stomps on it. And then proceeds to demolish displays all over the store. Ripping down a sign. Acting crazy. Clearing the dairy shelf with his arm. Just knocks everything off. (laughs) It's like, fuck. And people are not worried about what he's doing. They're scrambling to get the stuff and eat it right off the floor. One kid just eats it right off the floor like a teenager. It's so gross. I was dying on the inside. I'm loving this movie even more now. (laughs) He takes a broom and he's swatting stuff. And he finally gets tackled by some employees. And he's yelling, it's going to kill you all. How do you know, kid? I honestly thought during that scene, like it would not have shocked me the way this movie was going if security would have pulled out a gun and shot the kid. (laughs) I I was seriously expecting that to happen. So one of the thoughts I had during this scene was, how long do you think this stuff has actually been on the market? Like, how long do you think this has been out there at this point? Um, doesn't seem like it takes long for it to become addictive. Like, like after one bite, it seems like it starts to kind of work its way into you. So I, I could see it being like only like a couple of months that it was uh, it was on the shelves. Uh, I'd say maybe a little bit longer because of all the backdoor business deals to kind of get like the FDA out of the way and shit like that. Yeah. So maybe maybe six months to a year. Okay. I was just curious. It's one of those random thoughts I had. I was like, I wonder how long people have been buying it. And, and then during that time, I'm sure like Harry's been licking everything off of his finger. Why do you have to do that? <laughs> I, I blocked that and moved on, sir. And now you had to bring it back up. So we cut to Mo during the day going to see Mr. Vickers. And this is Danny Aiello. He tells him he's from Consumer Magazine. So he can kind of interview him and get some answers. To what end? I didn't understand. But Mo proceeds to interview Mr. Vickers, who tells Mo he's been with the FDA for almost 19 years and he's retiring soon. Vickers confirms he was indeed part of the team that approved the stuff and it was tested, but he won't say how long. And he also mentions it's a dessert, not a prescription medicine. So who cares? (laughs) Some people care about what shit is that they put in their body. So Mo asks, what is the stuff and how is it made? Vickers pauses instead of answering and just goes, what was your name again? So instead of having to answer these questions, the writer secretly, not secretly, the writer uh, sneakily gets around answering these hard questions by just having him question Mo. Like, what? 
why are you asking me this? Who are you? I was like, that's lazy. That's lazy writing. <laughs> Give me some answers. See, I, see, after after knowing about the comedy aspect, I kind of felt like this was one of those scenes that was hurt. The way that the dog is acting and yeah. stuff, I kind of felt like there was supposed to be a little bit more humor in this scene. I can see that, actually, now that re- I'm reflecting on it. So Mo tells Vickers, I don't want any trouble. You know, I, I'm just trying to ask you about it because I'm hoping... You know, nobody's allergic to it. You guys got it on the market real quick. Vicar says, it's safe. I eat it. My dog eats it. It's fine. And then this big, beautiful dog is not acting the way the voiceover tells us he's acting. Like we can hear growling and snarling. But the dog, when they show his face, is like resting dog face. Like (laughs) he's not really growling and snarling, but we hear that he's supposed to be. (laughs) It's so bad. Even barking. Like the dog doesn't even move his head and he's supposed to be barking. So Mo asks Vickers if he's a chemist. And Vickers says, no, just an administrator. But I can give you some names of other panelists. To which Mo immediately claps back and says, they're all out of the country or deceased. What? He Googled it. He's got his lady on it. The lady with the ill-fitting suit and the clipboard apparently has done the research. Yeah, her, her name is Google. So she, he Googled it. He did some Googling. <laughs> <laughs> oh, these stuffies. So Victor tells Mo they tested the stuff in Virginia. And then he goes upstairs to grab some paperwork to show Mo. Meanwhile, Mo asks the dog <laughs> why his master is afraid of him. And maybe you're just hungry. And he goes to head toward the kitchen to feed the dog. Now, as a dog owner, <laughs> let's break this down for a minute. <laughs> Do you ever go to somebody's house and decide that it's time to feed their pet and then wait till they leave the room and try to go do it? No, no, that 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 is that is ridiculous. But at this point in the movie, I'm willing to accept anything. I mean, the dog literally could have got up and started making coffee for the both of them. And I would have been like, okay, this movie makes sense to me because this is just a batshit fucking movie. It is. That's the only explanation at the end of the day for my brain to not hurt is that I just have to accept this is ridiculous. So apparently that happened so that Mo would have to get up and walk past the dining room. That's why that happened, because he looks in the dining room and sees tons of boxes and containers of the stuff all over. He gets startled by Vickers, who gives Mo a file of the names of everyone involved at the FDA passing the stuff. And then Mo just leaves. So we cut to nighttime now outside and there's a freestanding location of the stuff with a neon sign, tons of cars and people outside. It's almost like a walk up old style Dairy Queen where people, you know, on date night would pull up and walk up to the outside window and get your treats and stand around outside. Okay, I was I was kind of thinking about like what it reminded me of when I watched it. Like, yeah, that, the Dairy Queen kind of thing, like the old but school it's Dairy Queen. Just the stuff. All it is is you just get the stuff there. Nothing else. <laughs> so there's tons of people outside. Of course, they're mobbed, and Mo pulls up, and that damn song "One Lick Is Never Enough" or whatever is playing on the radio. And it's 2.30 a.m. we see on the car radio, or he says it's 2.30 or something. And he's like, wow, that's weird. Well, it's clearly because all these people are addicted. So they got to come out at 2.30 a.m. You can't get it from the grocery store and take it home. (laughs) Only the freaks come out at 2.30 a.m. to get stuffed. The stuffies. So we cut to Vickers trying to call 911 because he is supposed to be being attacked by his dog. (laughs) Not really. This is so, so sad because we're supposed to assume he's being attacked. No. The dog pulls the phone from the wall, the landline, so that he can't complete his call. <laughs> that, to me, just at that point, I, I I literally wrote down, I was like, did the fucking dog just pull the phone out of the wall? Yes. I was like, what the hell is going on here? Then the dog gets super close to Vickers because he's kind of cowering on the floor now. And we cut to this terrible looking dog puppet head and the stuff starts to come out of its mouth like he's foaming at the mouth or something. And Vickers is going, I'll buy more. I'll buy more. You've got a room full of it, bro. We just saw it. Boxes and boxes. (laughs) What is happening? All of a sudden your dog understands perfect English. Thinking back on it now, uh, after you watch the whole movie, this scene makes even less sense because I assumed 
he Vickers was one of the stuffies because of the way he was kind of acting like the other ones. So like neither one of the, the dog or Vickers do not act like the stuffies do later on in the movie. So like it makes no fucking sense. That's why I was wondering how long you thought maybe this stuff had been on the market and being consumed. Like what is the gestation period of beginning of consumption to when it actually is taking you over, you know, because it takes time apparently. That was a scene that did kind of break it a little bit. Um, yeah. I mean, maybe this movie does take place over like several, I mean, there's, there's a lot of shit going on in here that maybe this takes place over several months or something. And that's why we're getting like later on, they're a little bit more like, quote unquote, zombified. <laughs> oh, such a letdown. So it's daytime now and Mo is sitting in a podunk town and stops. He's driving through a podunk town and stops at a gas station. He asks the attendant if he's in Stater, Virginia, which is where Vickers had told him to go. The attendant says yes, but everyone has pretty much moved away. Mo tells him, stop the gas at $20. And that stuck out to me because I was like, oh, is he like filling it for 20 bucks? <laughs> Damn. That's how you know you're old. When, right. When, yeah, yeah it's like, it's like you, you hear something like that in a movie and you're like, wow, that's a really good price. <laughs> <laughs> so Mo realizes that a car has been kind of following him. He goes over to it and there's nobody inside, but then he gets jumped from above by the driver. And this is Garrett Morris, chocolate chip Charlie, who punches him. And then Mo recognizes him and says, hey, you're chocolate chip Charlie. He says, <laughs> well, I sure as hell ain't the Kentucky Colonel. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, this is why we needed to have a comedy because that could have been funny if that had been a bit. God, the moment he showed up in this movie, I cheered because this was, <laughs> I knew instantly this movie was going to become so much better with him. in it. So Charlie says the stuff people stole his company out from under him. And Mo says he's investigating them. Same as Charlie. Charlie says his family sold all their stock to the stuff people. So he had no choice in the matter. Charlie says he came here to Virginia because his family, after selling, suddenly all disappeared and gave this city as their forwarding address. Sure enough, when they're having this discussion, we look up and Mo sees right across the street is a little podunk post office. So over they go. <laughs> what are the odds? <laughs> so inside this little post office, it's also kind of like a general store. And I noticed on the counter right where they're standing, there was red tangy taffy. And I was like, so nostalgic. I was like, oh, <laughs> I used to get that on the ice cream truck of all places. I don't think I ever had a red tangy taffy. Oh, it was cherry flavor. Um, 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 um. <laughs> so good. Sounds like you're having a craving for the stuff. So Mo and Charlie interrogate this poor guy who's just doing his job at the counter. And it, it's kind of like trash dump post office and general store all in one. Like there's so much stuff in there. They can barely even walk. I was kind of grossed out by that too. I don't know if I want to buy anything from a store where it's just there's trash and shit everywhere and like mail. It's so weird. It did not look like the kind of place like, like this. This is the kind of place that like if you were like a 12 year old kid and you wanted to get your porno magazines, you knew this guy was going to sell them to you. Right? It's one-stop shopping, really. You get your magazine, your tangy taffy, and your loaf of sliced bread all in one shot. So he excuses himself after asking the men to leave him alone, and he goes out the back door. And <laughs> Chocolate Chip Charlie says, again, another funny line from Garrett Morris, the man is not in proper operating order. <laughs> That's one way to put it. <laughs> What's so great about him is it's like the lines, if Arsenio was delivering that line, it would have been like, eh, okay, that was kind of funny. But the way Garrett Morris delivers these lines is just fucking hilarious. So we hear the man in the back making weird noises, and we get to see a shot of him lying on the floor with white stuff, having left his body and gone out his mouth and out a window <laughs> and oozed away. I must reiterate again, people, this is not a porno movie. The way we are describing this sounds like this is a triple X movie. <laughs> it oozes it out of not. his mouth. Yeah. <laughs> they bust the door open and they are clearly not in the room with him. The overhead shot we get, they're not in the same space, but we're supposed to believe they are. <laughs> they're alone in the shot. 
Charlie comments, nobody's mouth can open that wide. We don't get to see it, though, because they're not in the same room, like I said. I want to go back for a second because you did skip over again one of my another one of my favorite oh, lines. Yeah, go for it. What when they were trying to get into the door, they're like, how are they going to bust in? He's like, oh, I can break in. Or Char- 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 Charlie's like, I can bust in. He's like, Michael Moriarty said, uh, okay, lethal hands, kill the door. <laughs> yeah, more than once, Charlie says he's got lethal hands in this. And I was like getting total Don Knotts vibes with his hands are lethal weapons. <laughs> So oh funny. my god, I didn't even realize that. Yes, that is totally a Barney Fife moment. The thing that made me laugh is when Charlie comments, nobody's mouth can open that wide. I was like, wow, I guess he doesn't watch enough porn then. So here's our porn connection because that's exactly where my mind went. This whole fucking movie is a porn connection. <laughs> so we cut to Mo and Charlie outside and it's dark now. They get chased randomly by several men with weapons. And they happen to run up to this little water area with a rowboat and they can just hop right in and take off after having punched in the faces of two of these men, revealing lots of the white stuff. (laughs) It's so bizarre. It is. uh... Yeah. Like what the fuck is happening? And they hop in a boat. Like what? I I love the fact that it was chocolate chip Charlie with the the only thing chocolate chip Charlie knows better than fighting is running. (laughs) (laughs) We abruptly cut to a diner where Mo and Charlie get some coffee and Mo tells Charlie he wants him to go to Washington, D.C. and see Special Agent Frank Herbert at the FBI. His logic is that they won't believe him, so he needs to send Charlie. Yeah, because obviously Chocolate Chip Charlie is going to be the one that's going to, you know, like the FBI is going to believe him. If some guy comes running in acting all crazy going, you're not going to believe this. No, we don't. We don't believe it. You're right. So Mo asks to bum a ride with a total stranger down the highway. We see that the eavesdropping waitress goes back into her freezer after she told them they were completely out of the stuff. Her freezer is stocked full of the stuff. My question was, why lie? Who cares? Because at this point, the stuff has taken over everyone's brain. And so now it's collectively controlling everyone. And it knows that Chocolate Chip Charlie and Mo are going to bring it down. And so like they have to stop these two people from bringing down the whole stuff empire. Yeah, I guess. I, I, like the, I, like I the fucking... Borg, they're all of one mind. <laughs> exactly. I was like, like, just saying it just made me feel dumber. <laughs> so back on the mean streets of New York, Mo is walking around. There's, there's a lady even, they walk by this cart, like a little hot dog cart, but it's the stuff. <laughs> This lady's just standing on the street selling the stuff. They walk past her. She pulls out a radio and says, here he comes. (laughs) So this is Mo now. Not not Charlie. My bad. Just Mo. Because Charlie went off to Washington. So they're like, here he comes. So a van comes whipping around the corner, almost hitting Mo. Not trying that hard because he really could have hit him. If you're watching like how this plays out, they didn't try hard enough. Oh, I, I didn't get that at all. I thought they tried really hard. Just Mo is so skilled at doing his job that he was just able just, to, yeah, just like duck out of the way because he's this amazing at everything he does. It's the confidence it gets you through, see? So we cut to Mo in a one-on-one meeting with a guy who says he's the distributor for the stuff. He tells Mo he doesn't eat it and has no idea what it is. Mo threatens to shut the guy down. My thought was... So you shut down one distributor. Big deal. They'll get other distributors or they probably have multiple distributors. What are you accomplishing really by threatening this one guy? Maybe he's like the the mafia boss of all distributors. I mean, like (laughs) the Dawn distributor. Yeah. So it's like you shut him down. All the others just suddenly fade away into non-existence. So the guy hands Mo $25,000 in cash and a contract and says Mo can have a job as his head of security. Come work for me. Mo puts the money and the contract in his pocket. (laughs) Cut to Mo walking and talking with the director lady from earlier. And this is where they call her Miss Kendall. So that's why I've called her that in my notes. He confesses in a very abruptly, once again, cut scene. That he's an industrial saboteur and that he lied to her before about who he was. She was okay with this. (laughs) 
because we immediately cut to them entering the facility together and she's suggesting ideas on how to stop the stuff. Very abruptly cut. It was very like, what is happening? They don't finish their conversation, but she seems to be okay with it. I guess she doesn't question it. <laughs> you lied to me. Great. It's like you said, it, it was so choppy. And then now knowing that there's like 30 minutes missing from the movie that it feels like, yeah, like maybe there was a fight as to how they wanted the direction to go. And then instead of trying to like clean up the shot and the editing, they just like, fuck it. We're just going to put it out as it is. Super disappointing actually, because this might be improved with extra extra stuff in it. This had the possibility to become a really good movie, like one way or the other, comedy or horror. This could have been a great movie. Instead, it is a great masterpiece of trash that I absolutely am loving. <laughs> so we see now that they're in the same lab that he was in before. Mo says he needs to go with her to the stuff factory later tonight to get proof. Proof of what? <laughs> They're already analyzing the stuff and they can't figure out what it's made of. What proof are you going to get by going to the factory? This plot makes no sense. I kind of get the feeling like watching this, you kind of like were having flashbacks to wanting to go back and watch Dark Man again. I hate you. <laughs> so one of the men shoves a newspaper into Mo's face. Back when we had physical papers to get our news. The story is about the kid that had a fit in a grocery store destroying all the displays. Mo says he's got to go see that kid. And he tells Miss Kendall he'll see her at the airport tonight. That leads me to believe, because <laughs> I have to piece this shit together myself, because the script sure as hell doesn't do it, that this family lives in New York, where they are. Because he's going to go see them during the day to see the kid and still make it to the airport tonight with her. So I'm like, oh, okay, they must live in this city. Now, later we get shots of the home and they look like they don't live in the city. <laughs> but whatever. It could have been like one of those suburbs uh, in New York. And I've seen some movies in New York where they have the suburbs and it's like they got the nice houses and stuff. Yeah. All right, listeners, that is going to wrap up our discussion. Well, part one of our discussion on the movie The Stuff. If you're interested in checking out The Stuff, it is currently at the time of this recording free on Tubi, Pluto TV, or pay streaming on Amazon Prime. If you're feeling like you really need to pay for this, <laughs> I wouldn't recommend it. We want to thank you all for listening. Please come back next week for part two. And until then, goodbye. It moves. I saw it moving the refrigerator. <laughs> hey, freak, what do you want anyway? <laughs> hey, listeners, Movie Miss here saying we know you have a lot of options when it comes to podcasts. So we want to thank you so much for listening to ours. Please make sure to find us on our socials and join us. Be part of our bad movie conversations. We want to chat with you. We're on Facebook with an official page as well as a Let's Talk Turkey's discussion group where you can talk with other like-minded individuals who like bad movies we're on instagram at let's talk turkeys our twitter handle is at gobble podcast that's g-o-b-b-l-e-p-o-d-c-a-s-t and of course you can always email us direct we would love to get suggestions from you of movies you would like us to cover if you want to be a guest on the show we would love that so directly, that's Let's Talk Turkeys, all one word, at yahoo.com. You're still here? It's over. Go home. Go.